worship at St. Andrew Presbyterian Church, where as Christ's servants we glorify God, call, nurture, and equip disciples, and use the gifts of the Holy Spirit to serve those in need. We welcome all of you who have tuned in today. We'd like to remind you that uh, there will be online worship through the month of June. And as we gather together virtually today, let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. Mighty wind who danced over the deep and surveyed this shapeless void, sweep, sweep over, over us now, now and, and ready us for your, your creative, creative purpose. purpose. Divine word who commanded untruly chaos and called forth light and life, call to now us now and open, open us to new expressions, expressions of grace. grace. Eternal artist who formed us in your likeness and claimed us as kin, reform us and refine us, us to be bearers of your blessing. Holy Trinity, Creator, Christ, Spirit, who gathered the primeval waters, gather us in 
Then thus send us, us out our voices, our voices echoing, echoing creation, creation song. song. How majestic is your name in all the earth. earth. confess our sin before God. Lord Jesus, you send us to make disciples of all nations, but we, but we focus, focus our energies inward, inward and shy away from sharing the good news in word and deed. You charge us to teach your commandments, but we struggle to obey them and neglect to model them for others. You assure us of your abiding presence but, but we doubt this promise, promise and, and disregard your spirit, denying the power you give us to do your work. Forgive us, Lord, and renew us to be the church you created us to be. Wash us with your grace and commission us for service. In the name of the Father, Son, and Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Now stand firm in your faith, covered by the saving grace of God, and ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. First scripture reading this morning is from Genesis 1, 1 through chapter 2, uh, 4a. It's kind of long, but it's good to remind ourselves of the beginning of Genesis and the beginning of the Old Testament. So listen to the Word of God. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, 
and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome, and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear and it was so god called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas and god saw that it was good then god said let the earth put forth vegetation plants yielding seed and fruits trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it and it was so, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God, God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters, and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, <clears throat> and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. <clears throat> God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seeds in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. 
Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that had, he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of God. Thank Thanks be to God. God. Our gospel lesson today comes from the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, beginning with the 16th verse. Let us listen for the word of God. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we look at our scripture lessons today, these are two very important scriptures for the foundation of the Christian faith. The creation story in Genesis, and then at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' final words to his disciples. Uh, we've heard these all of our lives, we've memorized parts of them, but I think the challenge is we've, we've heard them so many times, we've heard so many sermons about them, we've heard about them in Sunday schools, there's that kind of cultural Christianity floating around that doesn't always get Christianity quite right. And, and that adds on to what we think these scriptures say. But it, I think it's always important to go back and read what it says and try to cut through all of that added stuff. And let, me, let me give you some examples. In Genesis chapter 1, the obvious thing God is saying here is God creates everything. Four times in this chapter, God does an act of creation and says, this is good. And then at the very end, God says, this is very good. So God wants us to know that this is fundamentally a good creation. That's, that's number one. The second one is that uh, who, who's acting here? Uh, the only person here is God. Until you know, animals and plants and, and we're created, but the one power we have to contend with is this God of a good creation. So there's, there's no question about God's authority. This is God's world. And we are a deliberate part put here lovingly for good purposes. Now, a couple of other things that come, come up with yeah, creationism. Uh, people who want to take this very literally. Uh, it's, it's hard to take these stories literally because right after this creation story, there's a second creation story. And it doesn't take you more than five minutes to compare them side by side and realize they give a different order to how creation came into being. Obviously, the people who wrote these stories are, are not dumb people. The, the, the people who've read these for centuries, these are not to be taken literally. There are some big ideas in these stories that we need to listen to, but how the world was physically created is not one of them. I, you know, that, that, what theological purpose does that serve to know you know, animals, plants came first, or humans came first. You know, the stories disagree with that. I have no idea what that would mean theologically, but what I do know is that this is a good creation, and, and God is the one power we really have to contend with as we think about good and evil and what we can be, what we should be in creation. So this is God's creation. So that's one story. The second story in Matthew in chapter 28 is Jesus' final words to his disciples. Uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, this is the final wrapping everything up in the Gospel of Matthew. And what happens is uh, Jesus tells the disciples this thing, very important, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And we think of all we, all we know about history and one of the things that happened in history is that Christianity became powerful, became, you know, the head of the Roman Empire was Christian, 
then all the powers of Europe became Christian. They went out and colonized the world and had you know, dominion over the world and uh, started uh, you know, forcing Christianity upon the world. And that's not quite what Jesus is saying here. I mean, a after all that history, we may, be, we may hear that, go and make disciples of all nations. What we saw in history is people literally going out and trying to force everyone to officially become part of the Christian church. Well, a disciple is a student. You know, you can't force someone to learn. You can't force someone to be a student of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, I think he's saying something much more gentle. He's saying, I've lived a certain kind of life. I've taught you certain things. Go out and as a student of mine, as a learner of, from Jesus, go out and invite other people to learn from me also. That's a very different thing than colonial powers going out to dominate the world. Uh, and I want to deal with that word, Dominion. It comes up a couple of times in Genesis chapter. You know, humans are given dominion over creation, which sounds great. You know, we're in charge, it says. The word dominion is really from the word Lord. So we are the lords of creation, according to the first chapter of Genesis. And we really have acted like lords of creation. Uh, the, the problem is we've acted like the human definition of a lord, which is often autocratic and powerful and selfish, and not loving, instead of acting in the example of our true Lord, Jesus Christ. If you want to know what dominion looks like in the Christian way of thinking, look to our Lord Jesus Christ, who humbled himself, lived among us, healed us, fed us, taught us, forgave us, eventually gave his life for us. So if we would like to go out and be, be lords of creation, that's what we have to do for creation. Our Lord loved us, died for us. If we want to be lords over this creation, we need to love it and sometimes even sacrifice for it. That's what Christian dominion looks like. There is no other Christian version of the word Lord or Lordship. Anything that doesn't follow that model of Jesus Christ is not a legitimate Lord because going back to the book of Genesis, there is only one Lord and that is God. So that is our one model of dominion. And so again, you know, the empires went all over the world, established the human version of dominion, often brutal, often unjust, and that's not what we're called to do it is not what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 28. He's saying, go out and make learners of my love of all the nations. That sounds like a much nicer history <laughs> if we would have done that. Uh, then baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, we've interpreted that baptism is in, 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 the, in the most literal, legalistic way. It's the way you become a member, a member of a denomination. It's, you know, if you want to become Roman Catholic, you have to be baptized by a Roman Catholic priest in a Roman Catholic church and a Roman Catholic ceremony, and then you, your name is written officially as a Roman Catholic. Uh, that's not the kind of baptism Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the bigger baptism of uh, going through the waters of the forgiveness of sins, leaving the old life behind, being cleansed and welcomed into a new life. That is what baptism meant 2,000 years ago, before all the empires and all the Christian denominations started wrestling with each other. It was a baptism of, of welcoming us back into fellowship with God after we had strayed. And again, that sounds like a wonderful world to live in, if we can be welcomed back after we have strayed. And we're called to do that in this final chapter of Matthew. And then finally, uh, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Again, that can sound very authoritative. You, know, you teach them everything I've commanded. But remember, Jesus' commands were to love, to love other people as we have been loved by Jesus himself. So again, uh, we've interpreted this in some ways very harshly. We've given ourselves a lot of authority at times. 
given the church, you know, the, the human definition of church, a lot of authority. This is just a call from Jesus again to teach the world about love. You can't force people to love. You can't use your authority to make love happen. Uh, love takes relationship. So what does this look like in, in the world? Uh, this week, we can't not talk about the death of George Floyd in police custody, the demonstrations all over the nation, uh, peaceful demonstrations in, in some, some places, and sometimes those have turned into riots, uh, some violence. What does this all mean? How, how can this be a good creation where an unarmed man is killed by the local government and people start protesting all over the nation and becoming violent, sometimes violence against the police, sometimes violence by the police back towards citizens. Where is the fundamental goodness we talked about in Genesis chapter one? Well, I think the reason God gave us Genesis chapter one is to let us step back, take a breath and say, okay, we remember this is fundamentally a good creation. So let's discover how can we get back to that goodness that, we, that God assured us is here. The demonstrations, the responsible demonstrations, I think are entirely appropriate. Uh, when you know, a, 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 an unarmed civilian is killed by that person's government, people ought to be upset about that. And I'm okay if they demonstrate every night of the year for a decade demanding better government than that. That, you know, calling for a more responsible government, calling for the government to be accountable to justice for all people, in my opinion, that's totally appropriate. Now, breaking store windows, attacking police, uh, police using tear gas on people unnecessarily, I would say that's not part of what we are <laughs> called to do. But demanding accountability, yes, because why? Going back to Genesis chapter 1, dominion isn't all about fun and games. Dominion doesn't mean you get to be a king and bring all the gold and all the food and all the power for yourself. Dominion means you have responsibility. If you're going to have dominion over your part of creation, you need to understand your community. Uh, if, if someone is being treated wrong by somebody in, in, in authority in your community, as a citizen of the U.S., as a, as a Christian, as part of the Christian church, it is your responsibility to say, why is that person not being treated correctly? Why is there injustice against my brother or sister, an, an equal person created by God? You can't just stand and watch that happen. You can't just close yourself in, turn on your air conditioner, lock all your doors, turn off the TV, and ignore that it's happening. Because you've been given dominion over this creation. You need to know that it's happening. You need to go talk to those people who have temporary earthly authority and say, you need to do a better job. And, and we have orderly ways to do this as a society, which is wonderful in the United States, is we have a way of working together, using all of our appropriate dominion together in a democratic way on behalf of all people. And that's what we're looking for in our Wednesday night fellowship. Uh, people were talking about demonstrations and someone said something very wise, which is a demonstration in and of itself is not going to accomplish anything. Uh, and a demonstration is, 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 a, is a yell for attention that there's an injustice has been done and we want something done about it. You know, that, that's, it's a cry for help. But what do you do after that cry for help? Uh, that's the important part. As citizens, we have to work this out. We have to ask, where did that problem come from? Not, you know, there's a, a few officers that were gonna be, charges are gonna be brought against them, and that's totally appropriate. They need to be responsible for their own actions. But it's unlikely that those four people acted with, with no other influence throughout their entire careers, throughout their entire lives, throughout the entire city of Minneapolis and the state of Minnesota, they didn't appear out of nowhere and become those people that killed a man on that day. There's a bigger problem in our society when that happens, when it happens by people that we were paying to keep us safe and they're, in, they're ending up killing us. 
Uh, and so we have to ask, what is the problem? What is the bigger problem? We have to ask ourselves, are we a part of the problem? Have we been ignoring these things too long? Have we been pretending like this because things are okay for me, they're okay for everybody? Our, our rightful dominion over creation calls us to take responsibility for this, the community that we're in, the families that we're in, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, our cities. We have an appropriate place we have appropriate authority as citizens to make sure these questions are being asked and to avoid these problems, to stop them long before they end up in a death or an imprisonment, before these tragedies happen. We have the power to bring out the goodness of creation that God guarantees is there. Our job is to believe that creation is fundamentally good and then to actually use the authority we've been given, to teach people about love, to share that love with, with the world, and to make sure that all of God's creation is cared for. That's our job. Uh, it's a big job. We never do it perfectly, but it, the, the, the work never ends until our life in this world is over. So take responsibility for your life. Work for the goodness of all of God's creation, for all of God's children. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us now pray together the prayers of the people. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of creation, for the goodness that is everywhere in creation. Give us the wisdom and the love and the courage to believe in that goodness, to believe in your goodness and the fact that we can bring good things out of this world. We pray for all the nations of the world. Lead the nations in the ways of justice and goodwill. Be with the rulers, the governors of all the world. Give them wisdom and courage and love. Be with all the people of the world that we can exercise the proper responsibility we have to care for our neighborhoods, our communities, our nations. Guide us all in your love. We pray for the church. Help the church to be a force for good, a force for love throughout the world, throughout all the nations. Whether or not people join us or agree with us, help us to teach the world about your love in all that we do. We give you thanks for the mission of the church over the centuries that has cared for people and healed people and clothed the naked and housed the homeless and fed the hungry. Help us to continue to do that good work in this time of national turmoil, we pray for all the police forces throughout our nation and throughout the world. Help them to not just maintain order in their communities, but to understand their communities and to truly love their communities and to love every person in those communities. It's a difficult job, and we pray for those, and we give thanks for those people who dedicate their lives to law and order. But help guide them. As we think about our, our mayors, our governors, our legislators, our president, help them all to serve with love in this difficult time. We pray for our fellow citizens who are beginning to despair that we may never see equality for all people. Once again, God, infuse us with your love, with your hope, with your sense that we are fundamentally good and that we can discover that goodness in one another. Finally, God, we lift up in our prayers those people we know who need your healing. Heal us in our bodies, our minds, our spirits, and our circumstances. We give thanks for successful surgeries of Emily Leach and Scott Johnson and Dave Mayers. We give thanks that Robert Diaz de Leon is able to go back to work. We continue to pray for his health. We continue to give thanks and pray for the recent graduates of the year 2020. They're going out into an uncertain and difficult world. Let them reassure them it's also a good world in which wonderful things will happen because of all they have learned. We continue to pray for people in the medical professions who every day are treating this COVID-19 disease helping us to survive and overcome it as best we can, often at risk of their own health. We give thanks for their faithfulness. We pray for those in retirement homes. Uh, we've learned this week that in Mary Beth Amon's retirement home, uh, the COVID-19 disease has appeared. Help them to find a way to, to end that spread of that disease and to reassure all the residents that they are as safe as they can be. We pray for Mary Beth Amen and for everyone in retirement homes and nursing homes as they face the frustrations of being in isolation, 
but also the fears of the spread of the disease. Loving God, we live in a complicated world. Guide us to show your love, to give of ourselves, and to use all, all the authority and power we have in an appropriate way to bring about goodness equally for all of your people. We pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christian Assistance Ministry, or CAM, is a ministry right here in our part of San Antonio. They have a clothing distribution center for homeless clients every Tuesday and Thursday. However, right now they're basically out of clothing. They have set up an Amazon registry so that you can go and buy bulk unisex t-shirts, elastic banded pants, new socks, and new underwear to meet this immediate need for clothing for the homeless in our neighborhoods. Our mission committee has already responded and has have purchased just under $500 of emergency clothing. If you'd like to also help, you can go to christianassistanceministry.org and find that link for the Amazon registry, or you can give a check to St. Andrew and mark it for Christian Assistance Ministry, or CAM, C-A-M. And now go out into God's good creation, understanding that you have been given the authority to go out and teach about Christ's love, to show the world what love is all about, to show people that they all have an equal and beloved place in creation. That may not be the way the world is now, but it is our job to get the world to that place. So do that good work with all of your life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>